What's up, everyone? So before we get started today, I'd like to remind people that uh, any of you that live anywhere near the Atlanta area next Saturday, a week from yesterday, or six days from now, I'm having a master class that begins at 10 a.m. on the 21st here in Atlanta, a place called the Vista Room. Tickets are available on my website at rickbeato.com, and um, it'll be great to see and meet some of you in person. For those of you that cannot come, I will not be live streaming it. Uh, people have been asking me that, so I just want to put that out front. This is really for to uh, have a basically series of live uh, episodes of this channel all different genres, what makes this song great, talking about improvisation, about ear training, everything that we do on here. Hey, Aunt Penny, my Aunt Penny is on. Um, also, if you're, um, for those of you that don't have my book or that do have it and uh, are interested in supporting the channel here, a lot of my videos are demonetized because I use other people's music on all these videos like what makes this song great or when I compare you know this musician to this musician or when I talk about different pieces and the only way I make a living is uh, you know people buy my book or anything from my store that's how I make a living and there's a discount code because I know all of you you know a lot of people on here um, you know, that helps you out. And um, the discount code is LIVE20. So L-I-V-E 20. I'm going to write it down here. And I want to say welcome to those of you that have subscribed. Oh, I did it wrong here. Hold on. LIVE20. There we go. That's the discount code. So the talk today, I want to, I want to give a talk on this thing that I've mentioned many times on live streams mainly on my second channel that's my, my Rick Beato Live, alive peter smart there's a person that has exactly what i'm talking about here which is aesthetic aptitude um when you talk about aesthetics you're talking about the appreciation of beauty and aptitude refers to the ability to do something naturally now some people have naturally have aesthetic aptitude, that they're actually, no matter how old or young they are, they are really good at recognizing what is great about something. You know, kind of like my, what makes this song great, but it's, it's on a general level, and it doesn't just relate to music. It relates to everything. I see Robert on here says, taste. And it is taste, but it's not just taste though. It's recognizing even in things that you don't like, what is good about it. Um, my friend Peter Smart that's on here right now, Peter is 87 or 88 years old, and he has aesthetic aptitude in droves. He knows what is great about things and what is cool about things, and his age has no it, there's no, there's really nothing that his age has anything to do with. It's, he just knows what is great about something just from whether he reads it. He'll send me ideas for what to, you know, shows to make. Hey, this would be a great show to, to, uh, to do and give me, suggest song or, or um, titles for videos. And it's really important for people to develop this because aptitude does not mean necessarily that it's the natural ability to do something. I believe that aptitude is something and aesthetics, these are things that can develop uh, through really, really getting into what is behind uh, you know, certain things. I'll give you an example. If you take something that you don't really know something about um, and <clears throat> let's say you're just a beginning musician 
and you see that a lot of people like something, some type of music that you don't understand. Why do people like that? You know, maybe, you know, some type of uh, weird modern classical music, let's say. Uh, but you see a lot of people like it, and you try and fi trying to figure out what it is about that that makes people that that makes people interested in it. What is it about about that? It's like people that like jazz, for example. Now, I did I joke and I I did a video where why do people hate jazz? But really, that was the thumbnail. But my video was about why people should like jazz. Um, there's a guy that I talk about that has aesthetic aptitude. When I was beginning as a producer, I would listen to records that I'd like the sound of, and I'd always go, oh, who produced this or who mixed it? And there's this guy, Andy Wallace, that I did a video out about early in my channel. Now, Andy was born in the 1940s. He's in his 70s, but he worked with all the biggest rock bands, starting with... You know, he, well, he started with Run DMC in the 80s, mixing the, um, the Aerosmith collaboration that they did. Worked with Rick Rubin as a mixer, produced and mixed Jeff Buckley's uh, record, Grace. But he also mixed Nirvana, Never, Nevermind, Rage Against the Machine's first two records, Linkin Park's first two records. He did everything from Sheryl Crow to System of a Down to... You know, all these rock bands, all different genres of music. And he was in his 60s and in the 70s, Avenged Sevenfold, you name it. So how does a guy <clears throat> that's that age know what is hip about something? He'll hear screaming in, in, a, in a tune and know how to EQ it and place it and what kind of effects to put on it. He understands. It doesn't matter that when he was born... He was born when John Lennon was born. He was born during the big band era, yet he could mix Linkin Park's record in 1999, the first record and the second record. Or he could mix Nevermind and understand what was great about the songs and what to feature. But I think that this really carries over into everything. For example, I've got a good friend that lost his job recently. He's a year younger than me. We've been friends forever. And he doesn't know what to do. He's a gigging musician. He had a teaching job. And he plays gigs for a living, but that really can't, he can't really make enough money to pay his mortgage. And he's got a daughter that's going to college, first year of college next year. And he's unbelievably stressed out, as you can imagine. And <clears throat> many people, when they get to this age, they get into their mid-50s or so, and then they've been, uh, you know, their company downsizes, or for some reason, they find themselves out of work. Now, it's very easy to get despondent and, and not be able to think of anything to do, or you can tell yourself that, well, I'm not going to let this determine what happens for the rest of my life. I'm going to change what I do or figure out the steps that I need to take to get to this place where I can actually do what I want to do in life. I'll give you my personal ex example for those of you. There's many people that have joined my channel and don't know my story, but I'm not going to give you the full story. But right today, it's July of 2018. Well, in May of 2016, so two years and one month ago, essentially, I didn't have a YouTube channel. I had a few videos of my kids up there for my, that I, when I set up my YouTube channel, I did it to show videos to my mom because you couldn't easily put videos up or send them to people. I never thought, oh, I'm going to be a YouTuber. I'm going to make my living as a YouTuber. That's an absurd thought, really, when you, when you think about it. Because on first glance, if I think about, okay, I'm in my mid 50s, I'm 56 now, I was 54 at the time. I had a college teaching position and a master's degree in music, but I 
stopped teaching college in 1992. And the idea of going back to college as a professor, well, that's not, that wasn't really an option nowadays to be a college professor. You, your terminal degree needs to be a doctorate, even if it's in jazz studies or what, whatever it is. The terminal degree when I was started teaching in 1986 or 87 was a master's degree, which I have. So, okay, that's out. I had gotten to a point in producing where I just didn't want to do this anymore because um, when you make 750 records, eventually it wears on you and you, and you get to a point where you know, in my case where I said, okay, I've not only have I done everything that I wanted to do in this, but I feel like the way that music is going, I don't want to be part of the problem by taking on projects that I don't believe in. Um, and that, and, and I don't want to be part of the problem anymore. I don't want to just make records because I need to pay my mortgage and feed my family. Now, I will do whatever I have to do to do that. But that there's a difference between doing what you have to do and doing what you want to do, okay? And that's where you really want to get in life is to where you are doing exactly what you want to do. And usually people that do that for a living are the most successful at doing it. So I started this channel and my one, uh, I would say the one thing that, that always differentiated me from many of my peers at school, for example, is that I can outwork most people. Call it obsessive compulsive disorder or whatever you want, but I can outwork anyone. Because uh, part of it is my competitive streak. I'm incredibly competitive and I am competitive with myself even. And it's not just that I want to win things, it's I want to understand everything. And that's really how I got into all these different genres of music. It wasn't enough to, to understand rock music when I was 15 or to begin to understand that. It wasn't enough to understand jazz or classical music, which is what I did in my undergraduate degree. I was a classical bass player. It wasn't enough to go to my, to get my master's degree in jazz studies. I needed to understand everything. I eventually quit my college teaching gig because I wanted to understand rock music and music production and songwriting. And I quit a steady college teaching gig where I easily could have had tenure if I waited for another year or so. And I went out and made no money trying to make it in a band, going from teaching at a university to teaching in a local music store here in Atlanta where I taught lessons to beginners, okay, making 10 bucks an hour. Well, I first started working in a blockbuster here when I first moved to Atlanta. I worked behind a desk opening CDs for people so they could listen to them and decide if they wanted to buy them. This is 1994, right? I would open them up, I'd close them back up, but I always knew in my head that this is just a stepping stone to what I want to ultimately do. Now, it took a couple years to put a band together to find the right people. I put a band together we wrote songs and I wanted a, to, to write, I wanted to find a group of guys that wanted to write a really specific kind of music, which we did. And we got signed to a record deal. Well, then things happened and there was a big consolidation in the music business right after our record came out and the record was shelved and we lost our, our record deal. Just before we lost our record deal, because we had such a disastrous experience in the studio with a producer that was drunk all the time, and I didn't know anything about production, I taught myself about recording engineering and production. I didn't go to a studio and, um, and interned with anyone. I went to Barnes & Noble or Borders Books, and I opened up 
books or magazines on on music production or engineering, EQ magazine, or um, you know any of the magazines that are out, Sound on Sound, and any little tip I could find, I brought a notepad because I couldn't afford to buy these, and I'd go find, look at books on recording, and I would ask questions to people. What do you mic a snare drum with? What do you do this with? And I would study records obsessively. I would. Um, I wanted to get better and better, whether it was, what does a good kick drum sound really sound like? What does a good snare drum sound like? These things were, I didn't know. I was in, I was almost 40 years old. I didn't know that because I never really listened to music that way. I listened to it like most people listen to it. You know, do I enjoy the melody of this, the lyrics of this song, whatever, or do I enjoy this piece? Now I have very eclectic interests in music, as you can see from this channel. Uh, Frank just asked, was I married at the time? I was not married at the time. So I was, I was 37 or almost 38 years old when I started learning to produce, okay? I knew nothing about production. I didn't know a microphone. I didn't know an SM57 shirt from a Sennheiser 421. I didn't know anything about tube amps other than I owned a Marshall JCM 800 and it sounded good to my ears. Um, but this ability to know what is good about music or about anything in art or about anything period is natural curiosity or forcing yourself to explore what people like about things. Okay. And I really believe that it, and it doesn't matter. I see some comments here about once you're married with kids, options for doing this get limited. I have three kids. My youngest is five. I started my YouTube channel two years ago. I was a full-time producer for 20 some odd years. Um, and I make my living through this right now. And it's not even through views. I decided, I said this yesterday, I was talking on, I did a live stream on Instagram. And I said that in January, I was complaining about how my videos were getting blocked or demonetized and all this stuff. And there's no way around it. And I said, okay, forget about that. The only way that I'm going to teach music on YouTube is by playing things and having it demonetized. I don't care about that. It doesn't matter. I'll trust in the people that follow my channel that they will buy my book or buy my t-shirts or whatever. Because I need to make the great the the best content I can because that is ultimately what this channel is about is teaching people and giving and putting together resources that I you know that were never there when I was growing up, you know, or that that are not there Anyways, you know, just in general, there are things that I've been lucky enough to have been a part of having hit records as a producer, as a writer, understanding royalties, you know, and explaining them to people, understanding ways to monetize your music. But there is this idea of aesthetic aptitude is something that I think anyone can develop if they really want to uh, invest the time. I really think that if you are, have natural curiosity that you can develop this, okay? You can figure out what is great about something. You may not know it instantly, okay? Because a lot of things that I that I take for granted now, I didn't know. It's only as you start to learn more and more about something that you start to understand what is great about it. It's it's a, um, um, it's a definitely something that you can develop. Don't be trapped by situations in your life. This is a really, really important thing to stress. You cannot let outside events influence where you want to go. If you work hard enough, not everybody, but most people can be successful in whatever they want to do if they're willing to put in the time. Um, I really think that 
that you know, uh, you know, this whole idea of being a YouTuber. I didn't embrace it immediately. I didn't know how how I could make a living from it, but I realized that this is something that I wanted to do. And then it was then I said, okay, well, what can I do to make a living from this? And I realized that, well, I wrote a book 30 years ago, my Beato book. And it was about all the concepts I talked about in all my videos. So this was, you know, a natural thing. I said, I, I, after one video, I put up a video. This is great, you know, probably three months into my channel. I said, oh, here's this thing, the Beato book. And it wasn't my idea. It was my uh, intern, Rhett's idea, who made me start this channel. He said, what are you doing with that Beato book? Why don't, why don't you sell that? And I said, well, how would I sell it? He said, do you have a PDF of it? I said, yeah, I do, actually. He said, well, sell that. And I did a giveaway. And then people said, oh, I... I want, or people said, after I did this giveaway for a week of the of uh, one PDF, people said, I want to purchase this. So I did it, and then I made an updated version that's 160 pages longer. Um, and I really think that um, that, that decision there was the, you know, that, that was one of the turning points in my life into getting out of, of a career that I feel I had done everything that I wanted to do in. And I was incredibly dissatisfied with because I didn't like where music was going in at least the music that I was having to, um, the music that I was having to produce in order to make a living. Um, so I think that, that, um, I tell people, I have, I have friends of mine and I say, start a YouTube channel and they say, well, what can I do? And I, well, what are you passionate about? Or start an Instagram channel. Now you can do that on Instagram. And people say, oh, well, and, and everybody offers all the excuses. Well, there are you know, it, it's, it's too difficult. There's too many people. If I would have thought, oh, well, there's 2 billion people on YouTube, what is the point of starting a YouTube channel? What is the chances that your channel is going to be successful? Well, the chances that your channel is going to be successful with that attitude is zero, you know? So you decide, you figure out where the need is, and you have to be relentless, you have to study. You have to learn from other people. You can't look at other people. I know so many people that look at other YouTubers and say, oh, that guy, oh, he's terrible. Or that person is terrible. I can do this better. Oh, yeah? Well, why aren't you doing it better? I don't believe you. I think that... that um, and I'm not encouraging... Somebody says, I don't think you should encourage everybody to start a YouTube channel. I'm using the YouTube channel as an example of of anything. It could be that you're starting your own, you know, school for, uh, uh, you know, you're starting a preschool or something, right? Whatever it is, we're at a point in our society right now where it's very difficult to for most people to pay for college. When I was in college. It was far, far less expensive. I went to school in, in uh, 1980. I started in college. And you could go to school. I, I probably borrowed $8,000 for college through my master's degree. I mean, it's unbelievable. My friend whose daughter is going to college now, fifty four grand um, to go for a year of school. And that is ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. And if you're going to go to school for something like music, it's really ridiculous. This is another reason why YouTube is, I think in particular, it's a place where people come to learn things. And I, you know, my channel is very transactional in that people come here to learn. They don't come to, to uh, 
I try to keep my introduction, introductions as short as I can. I try to uh, get right into things and give people things that they can take away with. I don't want to sit there when I'm watching something and wait for 30 minutes to get five minutes of information. I want to, uh, you know, I want it to be action packed. I don't know if you, I don't know if any of you've noticed. I've even shortened my introductions. I don't go and say hi, I'm Rick Beato. I just get right into it because people's time is valuable and and it's important to, you know, f for people to uh, be able to find this knowledge immediately. The thing about YouTube that is great is if I want to fix my hot water heater, I always say this, I go to YouTube, right? I had something wrong in my car and, and there was some sensor that went off. Where did I go? I went to YouTube to see because I was going to, I got to go get it fixed. I want to see how much the parts are, you know, so that I know if I'm getting ripped off or not. And the, so much of this stuff is, most of it is done by people that want to just help other people out. I, um, uh, I was watching videos today about, uh, I'm trying to think what I was watching videos about. I mean, I'm always watching videos to learn things. I mean, that's why I get on here. That's why I get on YouTube is to learn things. That's why I read books, to learn things. Um, I had an old teacher that said, you can learn a lot by hanging out. Well, when you're 56 years old, you can't hang out with a lot of people. <laughs> you got three kids, you have a wife, you can't hang out with people. So this is my next best thing. I'm hanging out with people right now, which is great. But uh, uh, there's my brother, John is on there. But John will tell you that I never give up in anything. And I drive people nuts with my obsessiveness about learning things. Um, by the way, anybody can buy the Beato book. I see people asking. It's on my website, rickbeato.com. There's 20% off everything on my website today for the next 24 hours. And the code is, the discount code is LIVE20, L-I-V-E 20. So that is how I support myself, is through, my, is through my selling things on my website. Because like I said, most of my videos get demonetized. I saw a lot of people like my yes video. You know, as soon as the video comes out, you get a little note from YouTube that says, your video has been demonetized and the money goes to the artist, which it should. Of course it should. I've got no problem with that. Although, you know, I think that I am doing something here where I'm providing them, not that they need it, but, you know, there are people that don't know Roundabout. You know, I asked my wife if she ever heard Roundabout and I played it for her and she never heard it. And I said, come on. And now I played it for the kids and they knew it. Dylan says, bum, 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 bum. As soon as the harmonic thing started, and it's the JoJo reference, exactly. Uh, he goes, oh, that's a meme. Everybody knows that, which is funny that that, uh, that that was the case. But anyways, the point being that, yes, gets, you know, all the people who's, you know, I've done 36 episodes of that, what makes us sound great. And everyone, that's millions and millions of views but they all go to the artist that wrote the song, which of course is fair. Uh, it doesn't pay my mortgage or anything, but uh, you know, uh, that's, that is why, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have people that, that I'm able to get by and do this. So um, I appreciate that tremendously to all of you that are here watching this, but getting back to my point and I'm almost done with it now. If you want to be good at anything, you need to you need to not only you try not to be judgmental of what the music is, okay? If you don't like it, many things that you don't like, you end up liking more than anything else. It's the old the songs that you don't like when you buy a record the first time usually end up being the ones that you're most interested in. Those are the ones that you come back back for years and years later. It's not the singles. 
When I did the Don't Take Me Alive solo on, uh, on Kid Charlemagne, to me, that was a huge song. But that was never a single. You know, people remember Kid Charlemagne, which wasn't really a big single either. Um, but typically, all the great, all the songs, the album tracks are the ones that become the best songs on the record, right? And you don't, they're not the immediate, the things you get immediate gratification. And I believe that if people listen to jazz or listen to modern classical music and listen to it enough, it, they will develop a taste for it if it's good. So um, aptitude, I don't think it's, I mean, you could say it's the natural ability to do something or natural tendency to do something, but it's not. I believe that, that you can develop your aptitude. I believe you can develop your aesthetic, uh, uh, you know, the, the, that appreciation of beauty is something that you can develop and, and you can develop it through asking questions to people that already like things like that. Or, I tell people, they say, what are your best videos on your channel? I say, go watch the ones that have the least views. <laughs> Those are the best ones because they're the ones that don't necessarily connect. It's either that people don't look at them because they look at the title and they say, oh, that's not something I'd be interested in. Well, maybe try it out. And I was never really great at making titles at the beginning of my channel. Um, I think I've gotten better at, at titles, but um, maybe I'll go back and retitle some of my early videos. But there's, you know, I talk about a lot of esoteric things on, on this channel. And I want to expose as many people as I can to as many different types of music. I did a video the other day where I talked about how to uh, improve or reharmonizing for pop music, okay, for pop songs. Telling people, instead of playing an F sharp minor chord, try an F sharp minor 11 chord. It's going to be a lot more interesting and you're gonna get a better melody out of it or a different melody than you normally would. So this stuff is, is uh, it's out there. YouTube is here, I'm here. People send me emails all the time. They put comments in here of things that they want me to do videos on, and I am getting to as many of them as I can. So I appreciate everyone on here for sticking around and making this channel. To me, it's I think this is the best music community on YouTube. The people on here are just incredible, and, and I appreciate it so much. So... Enjoy the rest of your weekend. The Beato book, everything on my website is 20% off. The discount code is LIVE20, L-I-V-E 20. We have more, a lot more new videos coming out. I'm going to be talking more about other genres of music. There's more film scoring. There's going to be more videos on, uh, on music production. And you guys are the best. Thank you. Thank you.